on Grand May to troubleshooting. Uh, as usual, I'm joined by my colleague Kat Covell. And it's a special day. And it's a special day because, hey, we'll never be. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you never get to see her, so I hope you're excited today. You get to see the beautiful Kat Covell. And we even have more surprises for you. Guess who else is here? Spencer. Hey, Mike. everybody. <laughs> All right, so this is the uh, this is the software support team from Los Angeles, but let's not forget about the person in New Jersey, Ron Cannery. Hey, Will Murray. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's just natural light. That's all just natural light right there. <laughs> yeah, we're all about that yeah, natural lighting right here. Beautiful. All right, so uh, since our topic today is uh, troubleshooting, we figured why not get the entire software support team together uh, to discuss, you know, things that uh, have come across our desk uh, in software support land, uh, those questions, etc. You guys have all submitted some wonderful questions. We have compiled it all in sort of an order that we think we can best cover, and we're going to do our best to get through everything. So uh, Kat is facilitating today, so take it away. All right. Uh, this one goes out to Will. Um, hey, Will, I have time code uh, input, and it's not working. Time code input is not working. So uh, I'm going to show you some particular settings that you can look at by hopefully sharing my screen. Uh, that showed up. Good. So you have the on PC software that I'm working with here just so you can see some settings. So time code doesn't really have an on off setting. It just ha it has however slot settings and uh, pre roll and after roll settings. So first thing if you're using a real console you want to jump into MANet configuration and make sure your MIDI time code port, which would be the five pinned in, or the linear time code port, which is the three pin XLR, is assigned to a particular slot. If it is off, you're not going to get any signal input. However, an additional way to troubleshoot this would be via the time code pool. Uh, a time code pool, you can see that the on PC is set to slot one because there's an additional uh, slot here. So if this was off, you would notice nothing shows up. So make sure you check your, what your slot assignment is. That means the incoming signal is now feeding into time code slot one. If it's a valid signal, this will be counting. The only additional place to check would be uh, time code, pre-roll and after settings for your slot. They default to 0.5, probably should leave it at that. And if you don't get a valid signal, then you need to check the actual time code signal you know, is it clean? You know, the square wave is it noisy, etc. And if you do happen to be using MIDI time code with on PC in this on PC software, go to the yellow ball, go to options, make sure the MIDI setting. Are you taking it into a command wing, or if you set this to no, then you could use a MIDI to USB adapter. And there's how I troubleshoot time code. All right. Uh, good little tidbit. Um, Spencer, I got one for you. Okay. Um, my fixtures are taking a really long time to fade, or actually I'm bringing up in the programmer and, and nothing's happening. I'm not getting any control of the fixtures. No control of fixtures. Okay, well, I always like to start off with the fixture sheet. Looking at the fixture sheet, um, you have that individual fade and delay layer that you can pop into. It's just like looking at your values, but in timing land. So look here, select your fixtures. If you have fixture sort, they'll jump to the top of the list. Um, select the executor that's running that queue. Hit go and you'll see, okay, all right, I got position timing of zero seconds. Maybe I need to go in and add a fade time. Um, so I, again, always look at the fixture sheet. It's always gonna tell you what your fixtures are doing at that moment. If there's a queue playing back or if you're in the program. Uh, the other place you can look is in the sequence executor sheet. So if you edit your executor, you scroll all the way to the right. There's a whole lot of columns here. Let's go on to the right. You'll see an I delay column and I fade column. Okay, this will tell you if there is individual individual fade or delay timings. In addition, if you scroll further to the right, you have more uh, control over specific attribute timing with the fade and delay. 
So right now, I mean, our general settings, our default settings are the queue timing, um, but we can go into each one of these cells and specify, okay, actually I want the dimmer to fade at 10 seconds for queue number two. Okay, so fixture sheet, sequence executor sheet, um, you also have your individual attribute timing, which is what we just looked at, that other column, and what else? We have also your exec time. So if I'm looking at the encoder bar, or if I'm looking at my uh, knowledge base for individual fade and delay, um, <clears throat> these are also the different places to look. Uh, I highly recommend taking a look at this uh, KB, it's very helpful. Will, can you jump over to screen two and then uh, change your encoder bar to show exec time and program time? Mm -hmm. So it's an, that's actually an on-PC setting. Yes, uh, and this is great to know too, is if yeah. you have exec time enabled but you don't see it on screen two, go into the option settings, um, change it to turn off command wing bar, and now you have program time and exec time on the far right of the encoder bar. If you, if you set time on exec time and you see that little red square, that's indicating that you now have overall timing for all executor playback. So if you notice that your playback is going at zero seconds and you don't have ignore exec time on, <laughs> um, now all playback will follow that queue timing of the exec time. So if you notice why don't I have any fade times anymore, well, maybe it's exec time is enabled at zero seconds. Also, take a look at the manual crossfade. If you enable manual crossfade and you hit go, you'll see a pull up uh, little indicator. <laughs> it was actually really funny. I had a support case where the guy was like, what does the pull up mean? I was like, oh, it's manual crossfade for, for uh, exec time. And he was like, oh man, I felt like I was crashing a plane into the, into the ground because he was being told to pull up, to pull up. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> um, so exec time, and then finally we have rate one. So a rate master is going to control how fast or how slow your cues will run, um, kind of like a speed master for effects. This is a speed master, or specifically a rate master for uh, cue playback. And you notice when you do have rate assigned to that executor, you're going to get that the asterisk and then that change time in the fade column and um, delay column. Well, not the delay column, but. And so you know the shortcut <laughs> to rate is you could say, hit the learn key twice, mm -hmm. and then tap a button on the executor to reset the rate one to one. Right. Um, also, a quick way to check all of those masters is to hold the group key. And I'll take you into that temporary uh, masters window. Uh, we have no group masters. Oh, but we have speed masters here, rate masters, and playback masters. Windows. It's good for troubleshooting. I would say that's a really good window for troubleshooting. I've given that one out yeah. many a definitely, time. Definitely. Hold the group key. But again, fixture sheet, always look at it. Sequence executor sheet, always look at it. It's going to tell you exactly what the cues are doing and what the fixtures are doing. Not in that order. All right, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, Will Murphy, this one's for you. Uh, networking. Oh man, just, it's like just in general, just uh, networking. Like all the questions on the list. Yep. So basically, networking is very arbitrary. People in this uh, business, you know, maybe you grew up learning about DMX. DMX is very kind of cut and dry. It either works or it doesn't. That is not true for networking because networking can carry lighting, audio, video, the internet, many, many more things. The more you pump into that single cable, maybe the worse performance you're going to get on your network. So um, that's one example of where things could go wrong with networking. Uh, however, there's, there's a lot more, and it's just practice. That's how you're going to get better at networking. Keep practicing, keep reading, look through you know, our knowledge bases. It, it is full of uh, networking guides plus all this other stuff, you know, there's guides, uh, details on networking. So, for example, a uh, common question is things won't join. You have two consoles, you want to join them together. Well, the you have to look at the IP address. Uh, so, in here, you're going to see the IP address of the console. I'm using a, a loopback address. 
Um, ooh, the name of the session is CAT. Nice. <laughs> uh, you know, 127.0.0.1 is a loopback address now uh, on a real network. You have to think of an IP address the same way that you think about the address of your house or your apartment. If there are two, you know, houses with the same address, how is the mailman supposed to know where to deliver the traffic? Same goes with IP addresses. You always have to have a different IP address for every physical device so the traffic knows where to go. Then furthermore, MA works with you know, class C addresses, so we tend to suggest that the first three sets of numbers match up. 192.168.0, the fourth number would be different. Um, we have this in MA2 sessions, for example, would be the, the KB that we're talking about here. And I'm gonna try to chat you guys some of these links as, as we go through uh, the webinar. Um, then additionally, so if your IP address is if the first three sets of numbers match up and you have two consoles connected directly together, no switch, and they still won't join, then maybe you have a version mismatch. You know, double check the version number. Where do you see the version number? 33.2.2. If I try to join this uh, console with another console running 3.2.2.16, they're not going to connect. The versions have to match. So it's kind of the two things. You guys have any more to add to that basic sessions? I mean, it can go it can go deeper and deeper, but we're trying to give you an overview. Yeah. Of here. course, checking yeah. your cable and so forth, but make sure it's plugged in. That's yeah, yeah. yeah, make sure it's plugged in. Uh, I think there's a little note on here. Make sure that if you do have your console plugged into a network switch, that the little lights on the network switch are blinking. And that helps you know you have a good cable and a good port. But then it can get worse because you have managed switches on the uh, out there. To avoid managed switch issues, just buy an MA switch. Yeah, then we can really help you. Can't really help you with the third-party Cisco switches. Uh, another common question we get is session collisions. Uh, what the heck is a session collision? Well, the cool thing is we have an entire knowledge base. This recently came out, so maybe a month or two ago, the anatomy of a session collision. We run through and explain this in real detail. If you have ever wondered what a session collision is, it looks like this, but it's not a bug. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> it means that you have two or more consoles or on PCs on the network that are masters of the same session ID. See how this is a master? If two of these consoles are on the net network that are master in session one, there's a session collision. Who has the newest data? So, you know, copy these over for your reading later. Or remember, you can go to support.acclighting.com support and you can find all these articles. Um, there was a question that came through from somebody, you know, they're getting constant session collisions. Hey, guess what? That's in our FAQ, sec <laughs> FAQ section down here. Um, constant session collisions mean that the two devices that were in session have become disconnected for uh, two seconds or longer, so they both take over as master. That could be bad cable. That could be... Um, traffic shaping or throttling through the managed switch. That could be maybe the dirty port. You know, as this stuff travels around the world, uh, you get corrosion on the connectors. Uh, maybe even something worse. Maybe you have a really crappy software installation and the console is not working nicely. Maybe even it's hardware. It could be hardware. You know? It always comes back to cables. I would yeah. think it always comes oh, back to cables. Oh, 90% of the, the time. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. 90% of the time it's cable. So that's why when you call us, we say cable, cable, cable. Do you want to tell us we're wrong? We're probably right. We do. Do you, do you, do you know the fun <laughs> fact about Ethernet, Will? What's the fun fact? Uh, how many times do you think it should be plugged and unplugged? How about Ryan, Ryan, how many times do you think an Ethernet cable should be plugged and unplugged? Once? <laughs> <laughs> a little more than that. A little more than that. Seven. Yeah, just to so, make sure it's seven. Either. Yeah. No, no, I mean uh, the life of the cable. Oh. The life of the cable is rated for seven times unplug and plug. you got to remember we're stealing from a different industry. Where are we stealing from? Those network closets in big high-rise buildings. These RJ45 connectors were designed to plug in once because why would they ever unplug and plug back in? Uh, that's why we definitely suggest EtherCon. 
those are rated for a little more plugging life cycle. However, the little pins are still standard RJ45 stuff. So uh, we know a lot of folks that do the big, you know, very important uh, TV shows. They don't want any problem. Guess what? They always buy a brand new cable. They throw it away at the end. Uh, to save a little money, they're buying, you know, just like go out and get a box of uh, cable from Home Depot, string it out once, crimp it, good to go. You can pay all this extra money for this big jacketing on these cables. It's fine if you want to, but really what's inside is still a 22 or 24 gauge little baby wire. It's getting flexed, getting crimped, getting stemped on, etc. It just goes bad over time. Uh, some other stuff, ArcNet, SACN, uh, Keynet, those are additional protocols. So I mentioned that at the beginning. The more protocols you pump down the wire, the more susceptible you are to network problems. Now, a network switch is designed to handle all this traffic. No biggie. Uh, since MA, Grand MA2 consoles are actually producing MANet, SACN, Keynet, CHP, they're pr it's producing it out of the same port. Guess what? We have verified that our products are not going to receive interference by any protocol that we're generating. But take an SACN node at the other end. Take a fixture with an Ethernet port on the side. Take, uh, you know, those inexpensive LED strings and power supplies from, you know, foreign countries. Do you think they designed those thinking that those things were going to process you know, additional traffic like MANET, SACN, ARTNET, Keynet, etc. No. If this little LED power supply was designed for a couple universes of SACN and you flood it with 100 universes of SACN and 100 universes of MANET, that's a lot of packets that that little processor has to open up and throw away. And it usually cripples them. That's the whole point of managed switches we make that super easy for you with the MA network switch. You can define what data is going out of which Ethernet port on the MA switch. So if you have a little Keynet power supply, you can plug that into port 8 on the MA switch, for example, and say only output Keynet traffic. The network switch in itself, though, has 16 gigs of throughput, 32 gigs of throughput. I can't remember the exact number, but it can handle all this traffic. It filters it. That's what doing its job. Uh, people asked about, you know, testing these protocols. We have an article on testing ARTNET. You know, people call us, right, asking, I don't think your console is setting ARTNET. I'm like, yeah, it is. All your settings are right. No, it's not. <laughs> Say, why don't you test it? Well, once you test it, you discover that the MA is actually transmitting ARTNET, and it's your receiving device that settings are wrong. Um, in relation to another article in here, the ArtNet article, uh, using ArtNet with Grand MA2, somebody asked a question about the you know, mismatch of numbers. Uh, ArtNet starts at zero, MA starts at one. Hey, we're just following protocol. The specification for ArtNet starts at zero. So here's a remapping uh, uh, window for you in the ArtNet articles. So test, uh, test ArtNet output with the MX Workshop. There's also a program called SACN View. You should write that down. I don't have a link for it. It's called SACN View. And that's a little utility that runs on Windows where you can test SACN output from devices. Um, and then little note here about, you know, configuring on PC, 3D, or VPU for networking in Windows. Oh, God. I'd be rich if I got a nickel every time asked me. Somebody asked us, you know, how to configure on PC to connect to something. That's why we wrote this article. <laughs> we, with a real console, MA is in control of the operating system, Linux. So guess what? There's no firewalls in there. But Windows, now Windows is combating viruses all the time, so there's firewalls and virus protection, etc. We do not advise trying to network your PC that you use on a daily basis for surfing the internet and emails and all the above. You shouldn't use that for your show. There's too much extra protection that you need in place. 
um, to prevent viruses and malware and stuff. Instead, get a dedicated computer that's just for your on-PC stuff, run through our bulletin here, and unblock those firewalls. Very important link here is this one at the top, it says this bulletin. That tells you, you know, disable your wireless, disable your Bluetooth, you don't want to confuse the on-PC software, configure your IP address, very specifically run as administrator. Dive deeper, you got to dive deeper into, a, into Windows, allow these programs through the public and private uh, domains, these Windows thingies that, you know, that's Windows for you, and then very specifically disabling each profile in the firewall. This is a very common step that people miss. They think they disabled their firewall. They didn't dive in and disable each profile. That's important stuff there. Hey, Will. Yeah. A little plug. What kind of computer would you recommend for on PC? Oh, we have one of those. If you go to our knowledge base, recommended, wait a minute, recommended hardware specs. Oh, there we go. Computer hardware for MA software. If you jump here, uh, ACT recommended computers. Uh, we have uh, a few months ago, uh, Polywell has helped us out by uh, helping us configure a couple of these. This machine is about the size of a Mac Mini. Here's a 1U rack mount computer. Gives you three monitor outputs on the back, two LANs for you know MA and RNet, plus the USB connections. We have this in our office, fully tested, good to go. And if you click here, Polywell has a special site where you could just buy now. And you can see the price is $13.88. Um, if you're still looking for an all-in-one, you know, the beauty here is that you can, you know, configure your own touchscreen, one, two, or even three touchscreens. If you're looking for an all-in-one solution, you still have the Severnet that we've had uh, as a recommendation for a few years. Uh, you have to contact a specific rep at CDW to buy that. But it's all at support.actlighting.com. Uh, somebody asked the question, networking and wireless. Should you guys join your consoles together through a wireless connection? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Absolutely not. Please don't. Sessions are not designed for wireless communication because Wi-Fi has its own kind of clock cycle which affects our real-time synchronization. If you want to control your console wirelessly, what should you do? Remote. Yeah, remote. How many times did we get that question? A uh, lot. In fact, should, that's why we I have a bulletin count. for it. We <laughs> get that question. We have an awesome remote configuration guide. Yeah, so much. It's featured. It's even yeah. the top of the list. Featured. Thanks. <laughs> oh, geez. Um, so, Apple Airport Extreme. It's a great little Wi-Fi or, uh, router that you can configure as a wireless access point. It's very important to use wireless access point. And at the very bottom of this article, which is very long, you have a config file that you can download for an Apple Airport Extreme. Uh, it'll give you good performance for the remote. The remote is web-based. Everybody remember, it's not iOS app anymore. It's web-based, really beautiful. You got tablet view, phone view. Executors. Executors, faders, and buttons. Executors, yeah. Yep. Yeah, you control your executors and your faders remotely. Uh, definitely check it out. And I like this question. Mm -hmm. Best ways of networking to maintain a fast network? Uh, gigabit? Well, that's over the internet, right? Yeah, yeah over yeah, the yeah, internet. Yeah, yeah. yeah, through the internet. <laughs> How do you maintain a fast network? You use gigabit everywhere. You don't use QoS. You don't do traffic shaping. Uh, do, we put, do we put ArtNet and MA2Net on the same network? Yeah, don't mix those together. You'll affect timing. The MA and S, there's a reason we separate that one. Um, and make sure everything's negotiated 100 megs. Uh, sorry, everything's <laughs> negotiated gigabit. <laughs> don't, that, that don't, negotiate. don't negotiate 100 megs. <laughs> um, by the way, if you notice, little LED ports on the switches will tell you if it's negotiating at 100 meg or gigabit. Um, also, in network configuration, uh, it's not this one, sorry, the console, there's a link speed. You want to make sure this is a thousand. If it says a hundred, speed is negotiated at boot up. 
So if you're trying to diagnose why it's 100, make sure you reboot it first. Make sure it's plugged in. Try a new cable. If only some of the little, you know, there's eight, eight conductors in an Ethernet cable. If some of those are bad, it may, it may link at 100 instead of 1,000. Uh, you know, if, if there is a port on the Ethernet switch plugged into a device that is gigabit, take the console, plug it into that port. If it's still not working, then maybe you have a hardware failure on your console. What if someone like set that port to run at 100? Uh, it's pretty rare, I would think. But are you talking about the command? Mm -hmm. Do you remember the command? Set that P and then the IP address of the console. No, is it set network speed? Set, set network, network speed, that's right. Help. Set, uh, you guys all know command help set asterisk. So list all the keywords and start with set. So we have help set network speed. Yeah, we don't have <laughs> no. But set network speed, the IP address of the console you want to set, and then the speed, so a thousand. You know, I happen to actually know this is in the giant keyword list. It's just the search function that was broken. It's in uh, the release notes for 3005 in the new network settings. Yeah, right here. Yeah. So here, uh, set network speed. There is a possibility that someone's forced the software into 100 meg mode. Oh, it's so the speed and then the IP address. So speed thousand IP address, just like this example. Don't underestimate the power of the help manual. Or you could factory reset the console and that will. Yeah, you can factory reset. How do you know how to do that? I go to the knowledge base. What? What? You have a knowledge base for that? Well, guess what? What's it called? Update? Dual search for update. How to update Granite 2 via USB. How come that's not the first hit? Factory I'm reset. Not. <laughs> oh, welcome, Ryan. In fact, I have a question for you. You ready for it? Uh oh. All right. Probably not. Hit me. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, what are some places that I can look when something does not seem to be working? So very broad. When something isn't working, right. what do I do? Right. Well, when one thing I'll often ask when somebody calls up and says, "Hey, this isn't working," the first thing I'll say is, uh, "How do you know it's not working?" Like, what have you done to confirm that it's not doing what you expect? So there's there's several places you can look um, to kind of figure help figure out what isn't working or why it's not working. First place you should always look is the command line feedback, which Will has open right there. Remember, you can always open a temporary command line feedback window just by tapping the yellow ball there on the left side of the command line on screen one or screen two. Uh, if you want to open a permanent command line feedback window, which we highly recommend. Just always keep one open somewhere. That's under the system tab. All right, system and then command line. Uh, you'll see if it if it actually worked, then it'll be it'll be green and say it's hey it all worked here. Um, if you type something in and the desk doesn't think it's a real keyword, then it won't turn green. So like if you're typing with your keyboard and or you know running a macro and you're or you're editing a macro and you type something in and the desk thinks no this isn't right then it won't be green. Uh, and obviously, you know, you'll get an error there if it is like, this means nothing. This is just gibberish. Uh, so that's the first place to look. Uh, there are some things that won't show up in the command line. Um, you can also, another great place to look to see uh, why something might not be working properly is the message center. Uh, so there's all those icons on the right side of your command line. Uh, so if you just click on those, you'll get a little pop-up saying, hey, these are what all these icons mean. So uh, if you had a filter running, oh, well, so if there you may not see all of it, but if you hold the MA key, uh, you might see additional icons. Also, you can hit the button show all at the top right corner. That will show you the full list. So if you have a filter active, and that's why you're not able to store things that you're expecting to store, uh, you'll see a little funnel there. Uh, if you are in a world, and so that's why you don't have access to all the fixtures or attributes, or you see in red bars in your presets or in your uh, in your groups or something like that, that would be a world. So you see a little globe icon there. Uh, you it can also you, it even tells you what world you're in. World four. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. 
if you have uh, highlight or blind or preview or solo, if you're in any of those, you might see those icons on the right-hand side. You can also customize all of that. So if you want to make sure that if I'm in blind, I always want to see that icon. Or if I have solo enabled, I want to see that. Right? You'd open up the message center, tap the yellow ball, and then you can yeah. say, yes, yeah, show me this or don't show me that. Take a look at it. This is why the MA key was so important. If I disabled the symbol for blind and highlight, I would not see them. So when you're troubleshooting, make sure you just hold that MA key so you can see all the symbols. Okay. So that's, that's another place to look. Uh, if you are hit and go or bring stuff up in your programmer and it doesn't seem like the real fixtures are doing that, uh, another great place to check is the DMX sheet. So if you clear off a screen, go to the Sheets tab, open up the DMX sheet, this is showing you the actual DMX output of the system. Right, so if you say, hey, I'm running queues here, but uh, nothing is changing in my DMX sheet, well, then maybe there's, that would be something to look at in the console. If you're running queues or doing things in the program and the DMX sheet is moving, as you expect, then maybe that means you probably, everything in the console is probably fine and you're looking at a connection issue down the line. So maybe a DMX cable's in unplugged or your opto splitter, power came out of your opto splitter. Uh, if you're sending Ethernet to your nodes, maybe something there is not configured properly. Uh, if you have stuff parked, you'll see that in the DMX sheet. Uh, you can also, if you want to confirm that you have a good signal from the console to your uh, to your light, you can actually do DMX testing directly from the from the DMX sheet or from the command line to actually say, hey, let me try sending this. Let me there, there's that dimmer over there. I want to see if that dimmer is actually working, or if I can actually control it from the desk. You can grab that and actually apply a value directly to that, to that address, whether or not it's patched, whether or not it's parked, whatever. You can still override that with that DMX tester. Something to be aware of, though, with the DMX tester is if you have it captured in your DMX tester, you can't clear it out and override it. So you have to hit release all, or you have to say uh, off DMX through. Notice that the message center does in fact show an icon for the DMX tester. So that's another another great place to look for the another place to look if you got if you're not able to control stuff. Um, other places you can look for errors uh, or strange messages would be the system monitor. A lot of the stuff in there isn't really necessarily helpful for just general programming activities. But uh, if you're having network issues, we might suggest you take a look at the system monitor. Uh, you could see, uh, you'll see errors like uh, uh, retransmissions or NACs. You'll see, uh, you'll see those potentially in the system monitor telling you, hey, I've got, a, I've got an issue with the network. Um, we might ask you to look, for, to look for the system monitor to see if there's particular things happening in there. Um, you can also, another place to check is looking at your buttons, what buttons are highlighted. Did you want hey, to mention something about Yeah. I would say just to put it out there, the system monitor is really more for the developers. Uh, as Ryan was pointing out, there periodically are messages that are useful to you for troubleshooting or for us for troubleshooting, but it is a lot of stuff that is really uh, more for uh, the development. So I just want people to know it's not like we're holding all this information back, but like you get to look at command input and the nice thing about the system monitor is it's going to show you command inputs from all users, whereas the command line is only showing you your user profile. And then another one we do is retransmissions. Um, but everything that we know about system monitor, we really it, it's it's already out there. There's not there's not this big secret about it. Just wanted to let people know that. Cool. Thanks for that clarification. Um, let's see. So other places you can look at or things to look at when something's not working is what of my buttons are highlighted in the programming section? Is blind highlighted? 
Oh, I'm in blind. Is preview highlighted or blinking at me? Then I'm in preview. Right? Is my edit key blinking? Right? Am I in edit mode of something? Uh, are my How do I get out of edit mode, Ryan? Oh, if you're in edit mode, just hit escape. Just hit escape. <laughs> um, if you have highlight or hey, solo wait. enabled. Isn't, isn't escape the safest key on the desk? Yeah. Yep. Yep. It gets you out of edit. It gets the characters out of your command line. And, well, it closes windows, which is annoying which sometimes. Which is handy. And no, it's handy. absolutely handy. <laughs> <laughs> Way easier than a button. You need a tap yeah. key, tap escape. Yeah. Yep. So, right, so also check, uh, is highlight enabled, is solo enabled? If so, then those buttons will be lit up. So if you're like, why well, can't, I'm not seeing any color on my lights. Double check to highlight, right? Or, oh, I, all my fixtures are blacked out. Wait, but if I select this fixture, it comes up. Well, then you probably have solo enabled. Is black, is your grandmaster down, right? When you're, <laughs> by the way, when your grandmaster is below, below 100%, your blackout key will blink at you. Um, let's see, is M matrix enabled? Then set will be, will be uh, lit up. So th there's lots of things you can check uh, by just looking at what buttons are highlighted. Uh, also, what is the default, uh, your, the default objects for your command line? Right, right now it's channel, so the channel key is lit up, right? But if you said, uh, if you start, if you type a number and just random commands seem to happen, well, is you, did you accidentally set macro as your default object, and now you're just executing random macros when you're instead instead of trying to grab fixtures? I don't know. Right. So just kind of. This is a really keep... common one. This is actually a really easy thing to do. I say almost every class that I have. I mean, we usually have anywhere from four to eight people in the class, and guaranteed someone is going to do that throughout the two days, or they're going to randomly be in group or a fact. It's so easy to just hit please after you hit a command. So uh, this is a really uh, common one here. I like to call it the first thing you'll forget how to do because mm -hmm. you're going to be like, why am I in channel? Why am I in effect? Right. You just why am I, right. Why does my command line say DMX on the right hand side? Ah! <laughs> so uh, those, are, those are kind of the main places to, to, to look for if, something's, uh, if something doesn't seem like it's, if, like it's working properly. This is kind of your your first line of investigation. Cool. All right. What do we have uh, next, Scott? Continue. Continuing on with Mr. Um, Ryan. Uh, output doesn't show things I'm putting into the programmer, Ryan. What can I check? Okay. Well, we already talked about one, which was the DMX sheet. Right? So if you're looking at the DMX sheet, if you're doing stuff in the programmer and it's not showing up in the DMX sheet, then, well, if it is showing up in the DMX sheet, but it doesn't, it's not doing it on the fixtures, then check your, uh, you know, check your DMX lines and so forth. Check your signal path. If it's not showing up in the DMX sheet, well, first place, look at your keys and look at your message center. Do you have blind enabled? Are you in preview? Right? If you're in one of those, doing stuff in the programmer is not going to output. So, maybe, so that's the first place to check. Second place, uh, Spencer mentioned earlier about exec time. Well, right next to that we have program time. So if program time manual X fade is enabled, you can do all the stuff you want in the programmer, and it's not going to output. Right? right? So that's another place to check. And remember, if you have the if you're looking at on PC and you have the command wing bar enabled, program time will be hidden as well, along with the exec time. But How don't forget those? that you, yeah, you can also set your 100 millimeter faders to those, or any other executor. You can set to those as well to double check to see what they're doing. There's a whole webinar on special masters, by the way, on our Tech Talks uh, YouTube channel. So don't forget to go there. You'll hear you'll uh, an overview of all the special masters that can exist on uh, faders and 100 millimeter faders. All right, Spencer, you're up next. Ooh. Uh, how can we troubleshoot fixtures and fixture profiles? Oh, fixture great profiles, topic. my favorite. Yeah. Um, actually started out at ACT doing fixture profiles. I think that was a test for me. Like, Spencer, build this fixture profile. Like, oh, okay. 
But how do we troubleshoot if the fixed profile is working or not? Well, <clears throat> I like to start off with the DMX sheet like Ryan had started with. What I like to do is enable a few masks on the DMX sheet. So if you look at the blue title bar, you'll see that one option says show only values. Toggle that twice to say show uh, attributes. This will show you the exact attribute of the fixture profile that's assigned to that DMX address. Super helpful to figure out like, oh, my um, iris isn't working. So if I look at address, yeah, exactly that one, uh, 1.30. And if I look in the bottom left, you can see DMX 1.30 if my cursor is over that address. Um, it also tells me the fixture ID and the attribute and that it's course um, value, which is 8 bit versus 16. So I can look here, I can be like, okay, so I'm looking at this compared to my DMX sheet from the manual of the fixture. Oh yeah, remember that thing, the manual? Always have that on hand, or I mean, we have the internet in our pocket, so look it up. Um, compare the DMX channel chart of the fixture to your DMX sheet uh, right here. If this address, if this address is not assigned to the right attribute, then it's a problem with the fixture profile. So you can also use that DMX tester that Will was using earlier to test specific values. If the encoder bar isn't lined up right, you'd be like, oh, these two need to be switched. Um, so I always start off with a DMX sheet. Um, if you have a fixture profile that has a DMX channel chart that's a little funky, maybe you can't read it because it's in a different language, happens all the time, you could try patching a dimmer, a single address to each um, address of that fixture and uh, basically run through each dimmer channel to see, oh, this does pan, this does tilt. So it will send a patch like 30 dimmers uh, starting at that channel and 10.1. And then we'll address that physical fixture to 10.1, or just the first address. And then I can go through each individual dimmer and bring it up. Oh, address one manipulates dimmer. Perfect. Address two manipulates pan. Cool. Notice another right. another right. a quick tip when you want to do that is you can after you patch those assign those channels to channel faders, and then you can run the fader the channel faders channel up fader. and down to see for for another quick way to see oh, what is what combinations do these do. Right, and Will, how would I assign channel faders? Uh, channel sheet uh, link faders is this button up here. By the way, if you guys don't see these buttons, it's because of this yellow ball, the settings title button. So enable link faders. Uh, with link faders, now you have direct control of each channel right from the uh, motorized faders on your full size or light, or the unmotorized faders on your command line or ultra light. And another way is to assign channel at channel fader, right? Yeah. Syntax wise. You can you can you can if you jump to channel pages with the channel minus key, you'll see you're on channel mode. And you'd say assign channel one thousand one here, or I could say assign channel one thousand two through thirty. One thousand ten. Sure gives me the first 10. And yep. you can also do that from the uh, auto create menu. Yep, beautiful auto create menu, channel pages, I grab my, I forgot what I called it. Oh, that's fixture type. Give it a test and I can have it start on page two. Start fader one, page width is 30, create. And if I jump here and I go to page two, you can see all the 30 faders are there too. I kind of use this as a last resort if there's just no way of telling what the DMX channel chart is supposed to be manipulating. Um, that's a great way to do it. That's mostly if you don't have a manual. Yeah. You got to work through the channels, figure it out. Exactly. Uh, another way is to edit the fixture profile itself. And that happens in setup patch and fixture schedule, um, fixture types in the top right corner, find your fixture profile, edit it, and then here's all of your attributes. Now let's say that maybe my color attributes aren't working right. I can select color RGB1, which is the first attribute, and then edit it. This will look at the sub-attribute layer. Um, this is where you can go to manipulate the encoder value, so that's the from and to columns. 
Um, so I would recommend checking those. Check the front end to DMX. Make sure that's going from 0 to 255. Um, and then one step further, don't worry about from physical to physical. That's for MA3D. That's not going to change any kind of physical output of the fixture. But if I need to go one step further, and if there's function sets, I can select that first one, edit it, and uh, make sure that the function set is going from the right from value and the right DMX value. Uh, I've seen fixture profiles that have been manipulated so that uh, they've gone from like a fine channel to a coarse channel, and all of the from the two DMX are from zero to 65,535, but that doesn't work with 8 bits, so you have to go back in and fix it here. And where would you learn all about this? Oh my goodness, we have several resources to look at. First, the Fixture Profile Encyclopedia, written by yours truly. It's broken up into the components that you have, and you can read all about the components. You can start off with a basic fixture profile all the way down to each um, advanced attribute and multi-instance fixture profiles. We also did a three-part webinar, and it's on our YouTube page. Um, where Will and I talk through basically the fixture profile, uh, fixture profile encyclopedia, and uh, we call One, it the Bonanza. Two, three. Yep. Chock full of the information that you need to know. I highly recommend uh, spending some time with that because it is a huge troubleshooting saver uh, when you're on site and you're like, why aren't my fixtures working? Generally, the fixture profile. Or don't always knock the fixture profile. Sometimes it is that dang fixture itself. <laughs> And that's nothing we can do for you. Or things between you and right. the fixture, yeah. that, that too. How does that, that, that always correlates with people's natural uh, tendency to blame the $50,000 controller instead of the no-name fixture that they got from who knows where. Who knows where. Don't know why. Not from Clay Baggy. <laughs> maybe. Maybe it is. I don't know. It's technology. <laughs> DMX cards can go bad, so, true. so yeah. even in clay packy fixtures, uh, the components, components can break. Yeah. And also That's firmware updates. <laughs> fixtures can have firmware updates that uh, then yeah. the profiles for the wrong firmware version that doesn't match your profile or it doesn't match your fixture. Yeah. And if you have that issue, give us a call, shoot us an email, we'll be happy to help you. You all good? If you can't figure it out yourself, which is the whole point of this webinar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you are in the United States or North America, sorry, all of North America, that's who we do. Uh, give us a give us a shout, or else uh, find your local distributor. Um, Will Murphy, how do I get better at this whole troubleshooting deal? Practice. So uh, Google is very helpful, uh, just becoming a better troubleshooter. Uh, in particular, if you want to learn specifically how to be a better troubleshooter with Grand Anime 2, uh, read the forums. MHShare.net. There's 113 pages of questions. These questions are no different than the type of questions we receive in support. Yeah, my first day on this job, I couldn't answer anything. Seven years later, uh, maybe I still can't answer it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> you know, you learn with time. You start seeing what kind of questions, what kind of pitfalls people are dealing with. So, it is your job to be a programmer, or it's your job to be a master electrician, or your job to be a front of house tech. You don't just automatically know how to be good at this. You have to practice. So I always tell people, you know, set aside one hour a day or one hour a week for your continued education by reading through our knowledge bases, reading through MA Share every day, trying to answer the questions on MA Share, and that's how you're going to get better. Um, furthermore, there's a bunch of you know stuff on the internet about how to be a good troubleshooter related to technology. How do I get good at troubleshooting software in general? How do I get good at troubleshooting networks in general? Keep learning. Don't ever stop trying to learn. Um, what have I been doing this now? Seven, eight years? I still get stumped. You know, the only reason I know how to get around it is because I know how to troubleshoot. Trial and error and research. Kind of, sort of, the four of us together sort of know what we're doing. <laughs> That's really what it is. We, we kind of got this. We kind of got this. All it. of us together. Kind yeah, of transformers. That's what I'm saying. All, all of us together, we kind of got this. Exactly. Yeah. 
I don't know what else to say about that. That's just read things. Yeah. Right. Read trial and error. Yeah. Really. And trial and you know, what's, wait, what's one that we always talk about? It's like somebody will ask us a funny question, like what happens when I store this and set it to this value? Try it. I'm like, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, just try it. When you ask us that question, it's yeah. support. Guess what we're doing? We're trying it. And we're like, well, this is what happens. I guess. That's what your oops key is for. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you always save a copy of the show file before you mess it all up. I saw a question about how to undo cloning on our list. Um, you don't really undo cloning, so save a copy of your show file before you start cloning. Yeah. Before you do anything hairy, just save a sh you know save the show file and name it before I try yeah. something weird. So, Should I only save it in one place? <laughs> I think no, you, no, not at all. I think you, I think you equate it to storage is cheap, time is expensive. <laughs> oh, I like that. You guys feel that? All right, well, this is the important stuff. So there was a ton of questions about this. So let's move on to hardware. How do I troubleshoot my MA hardware? Yeah, there's people, you know, you, you're going to have hardware troubles out there. I'm going to give you a quick, quick, quick and dirty overview of a few things that I can answer and the rest, you know, enlist the help of your local hardware support. So if you're in North America, you can uh, contact us. If you're somewhere else, contact your local MA distributor. Um, what's the most common question, or at least the one we joke about? Uh, it won't turn on. <laughs> uh, so obviously, check the switch on the back. There's a power switch on the back. Make sure that's flipped on. Uh, it has a little light in it, so if you do have voltage there, it should be lit up. If it's not lit up, then it's probably not plugged in. Uh, and then further, you got to check the voltage. You know, if it's plugged into, you know, if you have a voltage issue and it's, it's 80 volts, uh, that little light on that switch on the back may be lit, but console's not going to turn on. Uh, there's voltage ranges. Uh, you can find this at uh, help, uh, the help pages um, of... Uh, MA lighting, there's a there's a quick start guide. Just to show this, the quick start guides for each of the products will give you the voltage ratios. Or somebody asked about operating temperatures, same thing. There's operating temperatures in here and storage temperatures, humidity, etc. Related to keeping your hardware functional. Uh, there's a lot of electronic parts in there. Something else to add to that, Will, kind of related. Um, but if your console is frozen and you try powering it off, and it's a light or a full size that UPS will kick in and then you're sitting there for 10 minutes waiting for the UPS to die, you have a hard reset button on the back there by the USB ports. It's a little yellow button. Yeah. Push that and it'll reboot the console as well. That's correct. That hard reset is right to the motherboard. You also usually can hold that front power button for five seconds, I think, uh, which is also a hard reset. Uh, the other one is uh, the screens are off. We've had that one before. That's just backlight control. Um, I actually think I just like navigated away from the page I was going to. Uh, oops, no, I'll wait. <laughs> change, there's a, uh, adjusting the intensity of the backlights. So sometimes the backlights, maybe they just happen to be off. Uh, just make sure that in this menu on the console, desk lights and screen options, desk lights would be the intensity of the backlight. There is a shortcut, hold MA, hold the two key, and hold the plus button all at the same time. That's the backlight control for the 15 inch screen. Um, that key combination, I give that out like all the time, probably yeah. like once a week. That's so a, MA, I want to know. the number two, and the plus. What I mean, MA, number two, and the plus all at the same time. That's, a, that's, not, a, that's not a software function, that's a physical hardware thing on the actual consoles themselves. Um, if you have one monitor that's out, then you're suffering a real hardware problem, please contact your local distributor for advice on how to properly troubleshoot that because it might mean going inside the console. Uh, external monitors aren't working, you know, got that call before. Uh, all you, they had to do was restart the console. If you try to plug external monitors in after, you, after the console's already on, they're not going to activate. They, they understand that those ports should turn on during boot up. So, you know, plug those in before you turn the console in and uh, make sure the external monitor has a power cord plugged in. Uh, that's a good one. And is, and is on the correct input on that monitor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
we get this one, you know, touch isn't responding, you know, the little screen touch isn't working or the big screen touches aren't working. Uh, that's this other page and then the, the change screen options. You can actually, in screen options under the console tab, you can disable touch for uh, the multi-touch and the big screens. Um, I realize maybe you want me to chat that to you. And then on the console, this little screen button, make sure it pops up. Uh, you know, a lot of times you use that to clear the screen. Um, oops, come back, hold that again. You can disable, oh, it doesn't show up on, on PC, I'm sorry. There's another button here on a console that'll allow you to disable the little 9 inch screen. Sometimes people accidentally hit that. So just be aware of where to turn those uh, touch screens back on. If, if the settings are enabled, reboot the console. Uh, Little touchscreen controllers are negotiated at boot up. If they continue not to work, then contact your local hardware tech. Uh, Ethernet port seems to not work. Best way to troubleshoot that is use the little blinky lights on a network switch. If you plug the cable into the back of the desk and you plug it into the network switch and the little lights aren't blinking, then you have a hardware problem. You know, obviously reboot the desk if that still doesn't work. Um, then contact your local support team with MA. I liked this question, whoever set it in, at what time do you throw in the towel in terms of fixing on site and when do you call the shop for a backup desk? Uh, I guess you throw in the towel when you have a show that starts really soon and uh, <laughs> it's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, you never know what can go wrong with hardware. Somebody could spill a drink on it, somebody could drop the console, somebody could smash the screens. We definitely suggest you have a backup ready. You know, a lot of festivals, for example, you have five stages. Keep one backup off to the side that you know works. Um, deciding when to throw in the towel is dependent on what's wrong. You know, if the console won't turn on, well, you need to call your shop right away to ask them if they want you to, you know, service it, try to service it at all. Um, if a screen is cracked because somebody smashed it, I think it's time to throw it in the towel. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Do you guys have anything to add to that question? Calling in the backup, I think, would be the first order of business. You're Just right. make sure that you, if you can't get it working, you have the backup ready to go. Yeah, that's a good point. So, that's a good point. Start that ball rolling right away. Otherwise, you're going up to the grid and you're setting up static value from fixtures themselves. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Uh, it's always good to have some backup gear. The more important the show, the more backup gear you should have, I think. Um, you know, there was just a list of stuff. Boot failures, screen issues, crashes due to hardware, ambient temperatures. I showed that. That's the quick start guide. Boot failures. Uh, you know, do a factory reset. I showed you that screen here on the dashboard where... Uh, I lost the tab, sorry, but there's a, you know, do the factory reset of software, uh, download a fresh copy of the software, uh, maybe you have a bad download, use StickMaker to make a stick again, maybe you have a stick, you know, I've actually seen this, you're reading about a gig worth of data from the USB stick every time you install software on a console. Guess what, USB sticks are cheap, they don't have very good hardware. Sometimes they get funky if they've been read too many times. Uh, that's why, you know, around here we choose to use SanDisk. You know, choose high quality sticks. Don't go for the cheapest one. Go for the good stuff. You know, it's an extra 10 bucks. Uh, it's going to be worth it for the headaches. Uh, As in all things, you get what you pay for. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I've done tests with cheap no name sticks, and, you know, I can get one install to work, and then I have to make the stick again. I think we're uh, we're at time here, Will. Yeah. So I think the rest are going to have to be webinar number two. <laughs> um, yeah, we probably should follow up. If I just, uh, what's another important one? We had a couple more items on the list. So, you know, support.actlighting.com. Definitely read through all the network sections. Uh, there's some, somebody asked a question about what's controlling my executor, um, or what's controlling my attribute. Guess what? It's another knowledge base, you know? 
you all thought you were coming here to learn all this stuff that wasn't available. It's all online. That's why we have a knowledge, ba uh, knowledge base. And I guess we could take five minutes just to cover crashes and freezes because I feel like I should just mention it. I was thinking that could be a thing. Yeah, people yeah, ask about yeah. that. Um, just to reiterate, if a freeze occurs, first off, freeze, crash. Two very different things. When you call us, don't tell us it's crashing if it's freezing, and don't tell us it's freezing if it's crashing. Crash is when all the screens go black and you're presented with the Linux root. There's a help manual page about it. Either. Yeah, restarting from Linux. So Linux root, all screens go back. It's just black. It just says GMA2 at something. Yeah. And, and we don't need a picture of it either. Yeah, we don't need a picture of that screen. <laughs> we know what it looks like. It doesn't help us at all. Yeah. A lot of people like to send that picture yeah. in. Um, that's a crash. A freeze is when it still looks like NA. It still looks like this, but yeah, like this. But I always tell people keep a clock open. You know why? Because a freeze is when this stuff's ticking. <laughs> the question is why does it freeze? A lot of freezes can be because of network traffic. So first order of business, unplug that Ethernet cable, unplug all those peripherals, leave the console by itself. Um, so that's freeze. Crash. What we want to know is if we created a crash log. So type crash log list. Ooh, there's a crash log here. Oh, look at that. Uh, and then use a uh, plug in your USB stick and type type in crash log copy, and it's going to copy it to the USB stick unless one was not found, such as this case. If you ever want to send us a crash log, send the crash log and the show file. We can't do anything with that crash log unless you send it the show file. And, oh, I have the version number. And the steps you took that try to remember to get the crash to happen so that we can recreate it. And we did have one thing. I have a crash log here just so you guys, guess what? You guys could read this yourself. Uh, what you're looking for is the, is the crash related to software bug or something else. Read or more just look at? Well, the thing you're looking at is what are the last steps that you did? I selected an executor. I stored a queue. If those are the last steps, Reboot into your show file, try those steps again and see if it crashes again, and now you know exactly what caused the crash. If it's more in depth, this is all that we can do here. Uh, after that, we have to enlist the help of the developers. So that's crashes. Cool. That's time. Well, it's time. That's time. Does anybody have anything else to add? This is a fun webinar. We should do it again. It's nice to see your face, Brian. <laughs> I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, I think we got to some of your questions like we anticipated. Uh, we weren't sure if we we're going to get to all of them. If you're based in North America, you can always hit us up via yeah, support at actlighting.com. Uh, if you're elsewhere in the world, uh, you know, hit up your local distributor with quite the same, same questions that you might have. And cool. What else? Well, that's no, it. That's happy programming. Happy yeah. programming. Happy programming. Adios. I'll see you